Our sermon passage for today is found in the Song of Songs, chapter 7. How beautiful your sandaled feet, O princess daughter! Your graceful legs are like jewels, the work of an artist's hands. Your navel is a rounded goblet that never lacks blended wine. Your waist is a mound of wheat encircled by lilies. Your breasts are like two fawns, like twin fawns of a gazelle. Your neck is like an ivory tower. Your eyes are the pools of Heshbon by the gate of Bat Rabim. Your nose is like the tower of Lebanon looking toward Damascus. Your head crowns you like Mount Carmel. Your hair is like royal tapestry. The king is held captive by its tresses. How beautiful you are and how pleasing, my love, with your delights. Your stature is like that of the palm and your breasts like clusters of fruit. I said, I will climb the palm tree. I will take hold of each fruit. May your breasts be like clusters of grapes on the vine, the fragrance of your breath like apples, and your mouth like the best wine. May the wine go straight to my beloved, flowing gently over lips and teeth. I belong to my beloved, and his desire is for me. Come, my beloved, let us go to the countryside. Let us spend the night in the villages. Let us go early to the vineyards to see if the vines have budded, if their blossoms have opened, and if their pomegranates are in full bloom. There I will give you my love. The mandrakes send out their fragrance, and at our door is every delicacy, both new and old, that I have stored up for you, my beloved. Sermon passage for today is entitled, uh, the sermon topic for today is titled, entitled The Biblical View of Sex. Good morning, good morning to everyone. Many of you are still asleep, I suppose. <laughs> The passage should have awakened you, right? <laughs> Why do I always get the controversial passages? I don't know. <laughs> I'd like to acknowledge some of uh, Dr. Neal's uh, students, right? Uh, PhD, PhD students. As I've said, I'm, that's a bit scary, having PhD students among our midst, right? You know, I feel like a lion in a den of Daniels. <laughs> we come this morning to a very touchy subject. Can you hear me now? There you go. Yeah. We come to a very touchy subject this morning. In fact, the entire Song of Songs, the entire book is quite sensitive, right? One that is quite taboo. And I'd like us to deal with a matter of sex. Ooh. Many are brought to embarrassment whenever the subject of sex is discussed. Would you agree? But I believe that this is the right place to discuss this matter. The church, the church where the Bible is preached, where the authority of God's Word is asserted. God sets the standard. And we ought to learn from God's Word what, he, what it says about this matter of sex. Another important venue, a place where we ought to learn about sex actually is the home. Again, would you agree with that? Christian parents should not be embarrassed when their children would like to discuss about this topic. They ought not to shoo them away, you know, but rather they ought to open their Bibles and talk to them about what the Bible says concerning this matter. 
It's part and parcel of the disciple-making procedure in the church. We are called to make disciples, aren't we? And part of the discipling process is to discuss matters that deal with everyday life, such as this, such as marriage, sex, and all that. I'd rather that we discuss it here than we get our information from the world. As we have already said, the Bible is replete with teachings and commands about this subject matter. Well, we come to our text, chapter 7. And the context begins with actually chapter 6. Uh, but before that, we have seen the courtship stage. I won't uh, deal with that uh, 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 item anymore. But we've seen that. We've seen uh, their marriage. We also have seen the conflict that took place. And that's the reality for married life. Married people enter into conflicts as well. And it makes them grow. Love making becomes even sweeter. Don't you think so? You know? Even as we uh, resolve these, uh, these conflicts. Well, this particular part, you know, begins with chapter 6, verse 12. And we see the onlookers, uh, which the, the book describes as the daughters of Jerusalem. You know, must be friends of the Shulamite woman. You know, and, and, and they were inviting the woman to dance. Apparently, she's a good dancer. And uh, they, were, they were prodding her, telling her to dance. And we see her response in the same chapter, in verse 13, wherein the Shulamite quite, quite reluctantly said yes to it. And yet, in all modesty, she was wondering in her mind, why, why do you want me to see, why do you want to see me dance? Huh? And she could not understand. In fact, all throughout the book, we see what, uh, how she could not understand why people admire her and why the king would even look at her. Because in her mind, she was just an ordinary woman. Well, we reach verse, chapter 7, verse 1. And the female friends describe the woman's beauty. The beauty of the maiden described. And we read in verses 1 to 5 how her friends describe her. This is uh, quite sensitive. They begin with describing her feet and then it goes upwards. Mm. And it says here, how beautiful your sandaled, seat, uh, your sandaled feet, O prince's daughter. Your graceful legs, after the feet, he, they talk about the legs. Your graceful legs are like jewels. Very vivid. You, know, you don't have to do that. <laughs> the work of craftsmen's hands. I, I love the fact that this comes not from the husband, but from other people. Uh, be, because this, this comes from uh, another person's point of view. I mean, if you were to ask me, uh, is your wife beautiful? My wife is here. You know, is your wife of, of course, I would say, she's the most beautiful woman in the world. Boggy points. <laughs> I, I, you know, that's, that's a bias, uh, bias assessment. You know, but when other people, even other female friends would describe, 
you know, the, the, the woman and would describe her beauty. Ah, you know that these people are quite objective. They're telling the truth. She is a truly beautiful woman. And then they go upwards to the navel. The navel. Your navel is rounded goblet. Huh? That never lacks blended wine. Difficult to understand. <laughs> Yet it seems pleasant. Your waist is a mound of wheat encircled by lilies. And your breasts are like two fawns, twins of a gazelle. Quite active, quite uh, plump blossom. And then these women continue on to describe their friend by talking about the head and the face. And the hair, your neck is like an ivory tower, you know. Unlike me, you can't see my neck. <laughs> but apparently, apparently a long neck is a symbol of beauty. Your eyes are the pools of Heshman by the gate of Bath Rabim. Your nose is like the Tower of Lebanon looking toward Damascus. Your head crowns, you know, you, you like Mount Carmel. Your head crowns you like Mount Carmel. Your hair is like royal tapestry. The king is held captive by its tresses. You know, he's talking about those, you know, how, how the hair is braided and all that. Oh, can you admire this woman? Huh? The beauty, something, something like, uh, you know, many, many Filipinos are into beauty contests nowadays, right? You know, ah, oh, Miss Universe, Philippines, you know. We would turn on the, the TV set and root for, uh, for our candidate. Huh? And there's a, an admiration, not, not only from men, you know, but even from uh, uh, fellow females, you know, they would appreciate the beauty of uh, the candidate or candidates. But then... Now it's the husband's turn, you know, as, uh, as she dances and all are in appreciation of her beauty, the man, the husband, expresses his desire. Apparently, he was being seduced, you know. Something, something was going on in, uh, in, his, in his body and, and, and he, he feels seduced by the dancing of his wife. And he says here, Oh, how beautiful are you? How pleasing. I hope that's how we look at our spouses. Hmm? Like when we Look at our wives, how beautiful, you know, how pleasing, you know. Oh, love with your delights. Your stature is that of a palm and your breasts like clusters of fruit. And then he notice here how he expresses his desire. Listen to this. To make love to his wife. He says, I said, I will climb the palm tree. Can, can, can you see? Can you see the correspondence there? You know? The husband says, Your stature is like a palm. Your body is like a palm tree. And then what does what does he say? What does he continue on saying? I will climb that palm tree. <laughs> That's a poetic way of saying, I like your body. 
I'd like to be with you. I'd like to feel you, to be with you, to make love with you. And then he also says, I will take hold of its fruit. Again, can you see the correspondence? Previously, he says there, the breasts are like clusters of fruit. And then what does he say? <laughs> I will take hold of its fruit. I won't elaborate on that. May your breasts be like the clusters of the vine, the fragrance of your breath like apples, and your mouth like the best wine. At times, wives resent the advances of the husband. Hmm? That happens. Go to sleep. I'm busy. I'm tired. I have a headache. Middle, right? <laughs> Please don't. Men are like light bulbs. Some people would give that illustration. They're turned on quite easily. You can switch them off and you can switch them on. Husbands, on the other hand, have to realize that women are like clothing iron. It takes time to heat up. <laughs> but men, men are easily, easily turned on and the gateway is that of the eyes. They are very sensitive to what they see. They see a lady, you know, walking down the street on a mini, mini, mini skirt. You know, and, and, you know, you can't help but look. Now, don't, don't think that all men are, you know, <laughs> this, this rotten to the core. Uh, uh, that's, that's the way men are. And that's something that we have to accept. But women take time to heat up. And, and this is the reason why when it comes to lovemaking, and may I confess I'm not an expert on it, but nonetheless, I've learned enough to say that since it takes time for women to heat up, lovemaking is not just the act itself. But it begins way, way back. Would you agree? It begins with uh, the talk, the sharing. It begins with a conversation, telling them words that lift up their spirits it begins with encouragement affirmation and then it moves on to touching because women are quite sensitive to touch conveying messages of love and affirmation that's the whole process of lovemaking but you must admit with me, as we read the text, quite evident, not only in the passage, but in the entire book, is the motif of the power of physical attraction. It's quite powerful. Now, we have to understand that the relationship should not be based just on physical attraction. That's a given. It must go deeper than that. Do I hear an amen to that? In fact, reality is beauty fades. Physical beauty fades. And certainly, uh, with regard to Solomon and the Shulamite woman, the husband and the wife, their relationship went deeper than just the physical attraction. You can't build a relationship simply on physical attraction. But you must admit that it is quite powerful. 
And we delude ourselves into thinking that it is not. The book of Proverbs has much to say about the power of physical attraction. And men, especially the men, we have to listen closely to this. Because, as I've mentioned, we are very much sensitive to the eyes. You know, that's the gateway of temptation. Solomon, you know, who I believe is the writer uh, of, of the uh, book of Proverbs, has much to say about this. Proverbs chapter 5, verse 3. Can we uh, read that aloud? It says there, For the lips of an adulteress drip honey, and her speech is smoother than oil. Stop there for a while. Uh, what the writer is saying is that physical attraction is quite alluring. It's enticing, you know? And yet, we also read that it leads to destruction. It leads to a lot of sins, whether this be premarital sex, fornication, whether it be an adulterous relationship. Proverbs chapter 6 says this from verses 25 to 28. Do not lust in your heart after her beauty. And let her captivate you with her eyes. For the prostitute reduces you to a loaf of bread. He, he reminds us of the consequences of that. Yes, physical attraction is something that is quite powerful. And therefore, he calls us to tame that. To put it in check. Not to allow our physical desires to run wild and lead us into a lot of disastrous consequences. For the prostitute reduces you. I love that. You know how he says that. He reduces you to a loaf of bread. And the adulteress preys upon your life. Says there, can a man scoop fire into his lap without his clothes being burned? I mean, you play around, you know, with illicit relationships and it's going to damage not only you, but a lot of people involved. Your family, your relationship with your spouse, your marriage. Think about that as well. Think about the damage that it will cause your children. Think about its effect on your friends, your relatives, especially here in the Philippines. We have a you know, closely knit family relationship. I don't, don't ever think that this sin is private. I'm not hurting anyone. No, no, no. That's going to affect a whole lot of people. And the book of Proverbs talks about that. You know, can a man walk on hot coals without his feet being scorched? You play with fire and it's going to burn you. Duh. While physical attraction is alluring, yet if we do not keep our fleshly desires in check, this will lead us to destruction. And the devastation is widespread. This is not an extensive list, but let me share with you certain things that make us vulnerable. You know, to physical attraction, to entering into illicit relationships. For one, we make ourselves vulnerable when we expose our minds to filth. When we expose our minds to fantasies. I remember Josh McDowell. You know, he was talking with a, a group of young people. You know, and the subject matter would be sex. 
And he asks them, he asks them, imagine that, the great Josh McDowell asking this group of college, college men and women, where is your sex organ? And the whole crowd was laughing and all that and looking at the bottom part, right? Because they were being asked, where is your sex organ? And he says, no, it's not there here and that's so true you can't detach what is down there from what is up here would you agree it begins in the mind and what we allow our minds to absorb would certainly affect the way we live our lives what do you watch Constantly, I, I am not one who would say, well, TV, watching TV is sinful. Don't watch TV or don't go to movies. I don't want to be legalistic. But I'm sure many of you would agree with me when I say that much of what we see on TV is filth. It's garbage. Would you agree? I mean, from the standpoint of Christians... Not only is there a lot of materialism, but it's Satan's way of infusing his values on us. And we absorb that. We take in much of the garbage of the world. And we wonder why we're having difficulty with our desires. What goes in? certainly affects our lives we make ourselves vulnerable when we expose our minds to fantasies we begin to uh, you know when when we when we look at this garbage when we look at pornography when we look at all these shows that are being shown on tv and then we meditate we ruminate on that that is certainly going to have an effect on us. We make ourselves vulnerable when we do not set limits or boundaries, right? Have you set your limits? Guys, men, have you set your limits as far as relating to women of the opposite sex is concerned? How far do you go in relating to them? You know, you work in the office, you rub shoulders, you know, with a lot of people, and many of them are of the opposite sex. Sparks fly. So somehow it affects us. And, and sometimes the, the woman bega begins to share some of, you know, what's in her mind, her problems perhaps, her problems with her own husband. You know, my husband doesn't have time for me. Hmm. And then you listen intently. And once again, you begin to fantasize, you know, of entering into this relationship with her. And we try to justify that at first. Well, I'm ministering to her. <laughs> you know? Or, or, or we say, or we say, you know, that's harmless flirtation. Brothers and sisters, when has flirtation become harmless? Set limits. Set limits as far as your relationships with other people are concerned. We, set, we have set our boundaries, my wife and I. And sometimes I, you know, my wife keeps me in check as well. My wife tells me, you shouldn't be too, too close with this person. You know, we have also made this commitment as husband and wife that we would not be with the opposite sex alone. For instance, I do counseling. Yes, and I do counseling with the opposite sex. 
But before I do any private counseling, I would ask them, could my wife be here? You know? If she refuses, at least, could my wife be in full view of us? And if she still says no, well, that ends that. Set boundaries. We make ourselves vulnerable when we do not heed the warnings of friends, close ones, true ones, brothers and sisters in Christ. And sometimes, you know, we may be oblivious to what is going on, but to others, they're disturbed by it. And sometimes our Christian brothers and sisters would come up to us and say, You know what? You're getting too close to this person. Or you're treading on thin ice. Watch out. And we kind of shrug that off and say, No. No, nothing's wrong. I'm not doing anything wrong. And that may be true. You may not be doing anything wrong, but it may lead you to do things that are wrong. And better safe than sorry. Heed the warnings of good friends. Friends who would dare tell you. You know what? I've noticed certain things you ought to watch out. We make ourselves vulnerable when we fail to foster intimacy with our own spouse. We'll be talking about that later. But that is also protection. Our relationship in the marriage bed is also our protection, both of the husband and of the wife. Not always foolproof. But nonetheless, it serves as a protection. Proverbs chapter 5, verses 8 and 9. Again, may I invite you to read this aloud. It says, keep to a path far from her. He says, do not go near the door of her house, lest you give your best strength to others and your years to one who is cruel. This will lead you to your own destruction. Spiritually even. This will certainly adversely affect your own relationship or your fellowship with God. Proverbs chapter 5 verses 15 to 18. Uh, the, the writer counsels the people, hey... Notice here, drink water from your own cistern. Do you get the imagery? He's not really talking about literal water and cisterns. He's, he's talking about drawing pleasure, sexual pleasure from none else, none else but your spouse. Your spouse. Running water from your own well. Should your springs overflow in the streets? Your streams of water in the public squares? And then he says in 17 and 18, Let them be yours alone. Never be shared with strangers. May your fountain be blessed. And may you rejoice in the wife of your youth. Physical attraction. The power of physical attraction. But knowing this, wives... You may also turn this to your advantage. Again, this is not foolproof. But as a way to protect your husband from illicit relationships, I think, I think it is not sinful if you take time to brush your hair, do some makeup, you know. Nothing wrong with that, nothing evil. 
It's not even spiritual to say, well, you know, I, won't, I don't do makeups. I, I, think, I think there is value in making yourself attractive at times. Not altering anything. You know, I'm not talking about major alterations, right? <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, at least put on, <laughs> put on some deodorant. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with dieting. There's nothing wrong with putting on some perfume. We snicker at that, men. But men, let me say, you ought to do the same. Hmm? I love this book by Stuart Scott. And he wrote this book, The Exemplary Husband. Love that. And I love what he says here. Listen to this. Men, make personal hygiene a priority. <laughs> Are you listening, guys? You know? <laughs> Cleanliness or the lack of it can greatly affect your wife's enjoyment of in intimacy. I mean, most often we say, ah, you know, we tell, we tell women, oh, make yourself pretty, make you do this, do that. How about you? We ought to do something as well. Showering, <laughs> at least one day. <laughs> Brushing your teeth, there you go. Being clean shaven, uh, that's exception. As opposed to the prickly pear condition of yesterday's shave, will demonstrate consideration and avoid creating a major turn off for your wife. Love that. It is difficult for a wife to be enthusiastic about a close encounter with bad odor. So there is some value in that. Use that to your advantage. And then, not only does the husband, you know, express his, uh, his desire, he's making some advances, but we see also the response of the maiden, the response of the wife. And she too expresses her longing for her husband. We read in verses 9 to 10, the longing for intimacy. The maiden longs for intimacy with her beloved. She longs to satisfy her husband's passion. Not, I have a headache. You know, that's not the response. But she says, ah, may the wine go straight to my lover. Again, see the correspondence? You know, the, the husband just said uh, that, you know, uh, her lips are like wine. The response of, of his wife is, well, may the wine go straight to my lover. I also love the fact that she doesn't call him his hus her husband, but rather she calls him with this word of endearment her lover don't you love that her lover something something like uh, 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 the husband calling calling his wife honey sweetheart huh? darling my lover that's how I call my wife no just kidding <laughs> <laughs> She longs to satisfy her husband's passion. You know, I belong to my lover. Isn't that biblical? You know, isn't that what the Bible says? Especially in 1 Corinthians, we'll be reading that passage. I belong to my lover and his desire is for me. She responds by recognizing that her body is not hers but her husband's possession. Her body is exclusively his. 
and that ought to be the case. Now, men may be delighted in this news, but we have to realize that it works both ways. The husband's body is not his, but the husband is exclusively, the body of the husband is exclusively for his wife. It is therefore important as an application that we try to learn the likes and dislikes of our spouses. Would you agree? Something that we ought to talk about. Sadly, we don't most of the time. And so, verses 11 to 13, we read of the Shulamite woman, the wife, inviting her husband to come and to be intimate with her. In some poetic fashion, she says, Come, my lover. Come, my darling, let us go to the countryside. Let us spend the night in the villages. Ah, responding to the advances made by her husband, the Shulamite woman, the wife, invites him to come on a trip to the countryside where they could enjoy their intimacy. We usually call this a weekend getaway. Right? Let me ask you, do you need that? People, husbands, wives, do you need that at times? A getaway, you know? I'm not saying bring the kids. <laughs> you know, that's, that's a different getaway. <laughs> you know? But intimate moments. Yeah? And, and, and that's... That's so vital for the married life. Couples need that. Special dates, intimate moments. Let us go early to the vineyards and see if the vines have budded, if their blossoms have opened. Uh, she's, she's describing springtime, you know, where there's full of life and vigor. And if the promegranates are in bloom, there I will give you my love. The mandrakes. Pause there for a while. Mandrakes are like ginseng, you know. Uh, I'd like to use something that is more appropriate for us. And ginseng, like mandrakes, are more of an af aphrodisiac, Right? The mandrakes send out their fragrance. And at our door is every delicacy, both new and old, that I have stored up for you, my lover. Again, I'm reminded of Genesis chapter 13, verses 14 to 16, wherein Rachel, Rachel was unable to bear a child. And she asks, for mandrakes or ginseng, <laughs> you know, if she was Chinese, you know. As I've mentioned, the woman uses this imagery of springtime where everything is fresh and full of life. And that's how we ought to view sex. It gives life. It makes marriages vibrant. With this, let me leave you with important thoughts that the Bible teaches us about sex. Very important. As I've mentioned, the Bible is replete about teachings on that. It is not neglected, uh, neglected to talk about this. It doesn't say, shh, taboo, don't talk about that. No, but the Bible is quite open. And the first principle that we read here is that sex was instituted by God. Yes, primarily for procreation, making babies. But more than that, more than that, 
its intention was to bring pleasure to husbands and wives. We're kind of quiet. Huh? But isn't that so true? Isn't this so true? This is the high point, the high point of intimacy between a husband and a wife. And it's sacred, isn't it? It's sacred as far as God is concerned. Please understand that God is the one who instituted sexual relations. He did this in the garden with Adam and Eve when he commanded them to become one and bless them by saying, be fruitful and increase in number. He's the author of sex. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17, we are told to enjoy everything that the Lord has given, sex included. Of course, this is all in the context of marriage. I gave this illustration the last time. I'd like to use it again, you know, just for emphasis uh, uh, sake. You know, sex ought to be enjoyed, performed in the right context. And in the right context, this is something that is beautiful since it was designed by God. It was invented by God, right? As I've mentioned, it is like garden soil. Garden soil in its right context is beautiful. What do we say? Ah, lovely. The soil here is so rich. Mataba ang lupa. You know, we say that when we're looking at the garden. But you take a handful of that dirt and scatter it in, the, in your white carpet in the living room, then it becomes the wrong context. You don't say, ah, oh, such rich soil. You, you, you don't say that. What do you say? Yuck. You know, kababui the pig. <laughs> and all that. Yeah. It's ugly. It's ugly. But in its proper context, men, young people, in its proper context, sex is something that is beautiful. But if it is not performed in the right context, it is an abomination as far as God is concerned. In the Greek world, there were some people known as Gnostics. They considered anything matter as evil. And so anything that gives physical pleasure is evil. I hope that's not our thought. That's not our thinking. And so in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3, in 1 uh, Timothy 4, verse 3, the Apostle Paul writes, they, talking about these heretics, talking about these false teachers coming from the Gnostic camp, they forbid people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods which God created to be, what? Received with thanksgiving by those who believe and who know the truth. Take that out of your mind if you think that sex is something that is evil. No, this was something invented by God, made for couples to enjoy their relationship. I hope that I stress that enough. Secondly, sex, well, let me begin what it is not. It's not meant for self-gratification. But it is designed to gratify the spouse's needs. And so the mindset, the mindset of couples ought to be, how may I please my spouse? 
the husband's the husband's mindset especially the man of course because he's the one easily turned on you know he ought to be thinking not not how how can i be gratified how can i have release no but he, he ought to be thinking about how may i please my wife sex is meant to gratify the spouse's need Take a look at 1 Corinthians 7, 3 to 4. Read this with me. The husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife, and likewise the wife to her husband. Now pause there for a while. Paul considers sex as a marital duty. And this is something that we ought to fulfill. Not for our sakes, but for the sake of our partners, of our wives, or our husbands. And we continue in verse 4. The wife's body does not belong to her alone, but also to her husband. This, this is what the Sholomite woman said. You know, my body is not mine. It's exclusively for my husband. And in the same way, the husband's body does not belong to him alone, but also to his wife. And finally, sex is to be done on a regular basis. That is the implication of 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 5, wherein he continues on talking about this issue of the sex, sex life, do not deprive one another. Do not deprive each other except by mutual consent and for a time so that you may devote yourselves to prayer. But then even that spiritual matter ought not to prevent us from doing this on a regular basis. It's an exception. He says, then come together. Come together. Again, so that Satan, read that, so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Hmm. Beloved, this is part of the disciple-making process of the church. Don't ever think, that this matter, this issue of the sex, of sex life is something that is not sacred. But we ought to get our information from the right sources. And the right source is what? The Bible. The Word of God. Parents, would you make it your commitment to teach your children about the biblical view of sex? Church, let us endeavor to counsel one another in this matter. Using the Bible as our source of information. We would like to build a healthy, thriving church. Join me in prayer. Lord, we've gone through this book for a number of weeks already. And yet we pray that you would instill in our hearts and minds this biblical teaching about sex. Lord, we are saddened, even appalled by bad information coming from the world. And we, especially our children, our young minds, Lord, our young kids, are bombarded with all kinds of information, wrong information coming from society. Sometimes it even comes from the school and from their friends. And this perverts their minds, Lord. 
Would you please protect our young people? And may we as parents, as Christian parents, fulfill our responsibilities of informing our children on what the Bible teaches concerning this matter about their bodies, how sacred that is, and how their bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. I pray, Lord, for our young people that you would preserve them from evil influences. Keep them pure. And we await that time wherein they give themselves to their future spouses, not defiling the marriage bed, but rather offering their bodies to their spouses pure. I pray for our families, marriages that are here represented, husbands and wives, whatever conflicts that may be going on, Lord, I, I pray for healing for these relationships. I pray, Lord God, that you would be the one to keep the marriage bed pure. That you would also protect us from infidelity. And may we realize that our marriages are a testimony of your love for your church. Bless these marriages. Bless our families, Lord. May they testify of the Lordship of Jesus Christ over our lives. Thank you for your word, which is alive and active and sharper than any double-edged sword. We repent of any sin that you are convicting us of. And we pray, Lord God, for a renewal of of our commitment to the biblical standards of morality. In Christ's name, amen, amen. God bless you.